Welcome to this the third session of the Central Moravian Church Lenten program series. My name is Hopeton Clennon, and on behalf of our Board of Elders and the Congregational Care Committee, we offer special thanks to Diane Shaw, who is serving as coordinator for this series. My friends Derek and Carol join me in making three presentations on the theme highlighting Moravian lives well lived. Present in parentheses. The Reverend Derek French serves as pastor of Nazareth Moravian Church. He is a graduate of Davidson College class of 1989 and Moravian Theological Seminary class of 1995. As son of the South, he has only served in the Northern province and only in the state of Pennsylvania. He has served Littitz. He has served Mountain View in Hellertown, succeeding Mary Matz, who was interim pastor just before Derek. He has served East Hills, Moravian church here in Bethlehem, serving as Mary Matz pastor as East Hills was her final church home. And now he is at Nazareth. He has been there since June. He and his congregation have, have only known each other in COVID tide. Last September, Derek celebrated the 25th anniversary of his ordination. The Reverend Carol Reifinger retired as senior pastor of Central Moravian Church after 28 years in ordained ministry. She co-authored the book, Let Us Go Over to Bethlehem, a guide to the Moravian community with her former colleague, the Reverend Dr. Douglas W. Caldwell. Along with Charlene Donches Mowers, she wrote four mystery novels with Moravian Bethlehem's historic sites as the setting. She is enjoying a busy retirement as manager of Central Moravian Church's star and candle shop. I am noting that there are 45 units plugged into our um, session at this time. I encourage you to put an asterisk in the chat feature so we can be aware of your interest in asking questions and we will be happy to call on you when we get to the question and answer segment after the formal presentations. It is my joy, my delight, my honor, my privilege to get us going with a presentation of the Leben's Law for Brother Mervyn Widener, 1915 to, nine, to 2005. Born in Allentown, Pennsylvania on December 31, 1915, Mervyn writes, I was the first born in a family of four children the son of Walter Ephraim Widener and Helen Ruth Gardner, both of Allentown. The first family home was located at 941 North Street in Allentown, a modest row home without an inside bathroom, just one block from the Cleveland school where I attended elementary grades. Because the Gardner family was active at Salem Evangelical Reform Church, I was baptized by its pastor, William Cosman, on April 6, 1929. I remember going to Sunday schools near our home and to weekday release time church schools. My spiritual journey began when, through weekday release time church school at Salem Church, a deaconess assisted me in preparing my first public prayer. That, dear friends, 
is the opening paragraph of a 13-page Lebensloff written by the Reverend Dr. Mervyn Carl Widener. I am deeply grateful to Mervyn's family, specifically his daughter, Jane Corvino, for providing research material, as well as photographs and newspaper clippings for the presentation of a life well lived. Bishop Ed Sawyer wrote this about Mervyn Widener. Bishop Sawyer says, he was a tireless worker and people lover and had a total commitment first to his Lord and then to the church and thirdly to humanity. When Mervyn was 12 years old, the Widener family moved from Allentown to Emmaus where he completed sixth grade at Central School before going to the Jefferson Building for junior and senior high. The year was 1727 and Mervyn received his introduction to the Moravian Church when a next door neighbor invited his family to Emmaus Moravian Church. This was where Mervyn confirmed his faith on March 20th, 1932. And I quote, while in junior high, I realized that I did not have any athletic, an athletic body and that I did not inherit my father's musical talent, but I could study and enjoy public speaking. When I participated in school play, debating teams and oratorical contests, an English teacher predicted that I would become a lawyer or minister." Close quote. While a junior in high school, Mervyn attended a consecration service of a Christian Endeavor convention held at Cedarcrest College. It was during this service that he made the commitment to be a candidate for the Christian ministry of the Moravian Church. Mervyn graduated from Emmaus High School in 1933. As the class orator, I addressed the high school commencement audience on the holy experiment of William Penn and was offered but did not accept a scholarship to Muhlenberg College because of prior decision to enter Moravian College. The Christian Endeavor movement in vogue during early decades of the 20th century was the major influence in shaping my spiritual pilgrimage as a youth. Through weekly meetings, we learned how to pray in public, plan and lead worship and develop leadership skills. During college and seminary years, I served as president of the Eastern District Christian Endeavor Union and appeared at many district churches. This then led to my leadership at a convention at Linden Hall in Littitz and to the conference director, to be conference director in outdoor ministry at Camp Inaba, a rented Methodist camp near Pottstown. It was there where I led young people to raise funds as a down payment on a camp of our own when Camp Hope, New Jersey was purchased and developed. I was the first director of the Young People's Conference. He continues in his Lebensloff. At Moravian College, I participated in the debating team, communion, literary society, staff of college news, and the Alpha Kappa Alpha fraternity. As a sophomore, I won second prize in the John Beck oratorical contest and used the money to go with a classmate, Edward Edmund Schwartz, to his home in Winston-Salem for Easter vacation. He had already chosen for me to meet Catherine Brandon. In meeting her for the first time, the bubbly, Pert brunette with a radiant smile and blue eyes, I knew instantly that he made the right choice for me. And friends, to make a long story short, 
There was a spark of romance. There was a challenge of 500 miles between them. There was correspondence by letters. There was a Southern province youth conference at Camp Haines in the summer, the winning of more prize money in more oratorical contests and another visit to Winston-Salem during Easter. And by Thanksgiving, 1936, Catherine was making her first trip north to meet the Widener family. From the third visit onward to Winston-Salem, Mervyn writes, I was welcome to stay at the Brandon home. Mervyn graduated Moravian Theological Seminary in, on June 1st, 1940 and shared the John David Bishop Prize for ac academic excellence. He received the call to serve as inner city, an inner city congregation in Philadelphia in a community in transition from a residential to a commercial community. This call to serve First Moravian Church came on March 4th, 1941. Mervyn was ordained on March 23rd, 1941 and installed on March 30th. Mervyn and Catherine were married at Calvary Moravian Church in Winston-Salem on June 28th, 1941. Mervyn writes, our wedding far exceeded my expectations. The Reverend Edmund Schwartz and Bishop J. Kenneth Fowle officiated with our classmates and family and members in the wedding party and guests from the North as well as from the immediate area. Catherine's parents entertained at a reception in their home. After a brief honeymoon, we drove to Philadelphia to enter our new home we were so happy to be together in our first home after a courtship of more than six years and so pleased to have an open home with many visitors. We were warmly welcomed at the church and a formal reception was tended us on October 9. Our first child, daughter Carol Ann, was born August 26, 1943. Two years later, November 23, 1945, a second child died during birth, but Catherine recovered well. On March 9, 1945, Dr. Edwin Heath, president of Moravian College for Women and Seminary for Girls, came to announce that I was selected to be his assistant for a year and then become his successor. I declined that appointment, as well as a call to the First Church of Bethlehem in April. But on October 27th, I accepted the call to start a new church in Allentown's East End. Without a church building or parsonage and at a lower salary. An old farmhouse on a tract of land on the east end of Allentown in the center of a new housing development was renovated to be the community house. We moved into the home at 1204 Van Buren Street in January 1946, following door-to-door -door visitation and recruiting leadership. Community House was opened on March 10th and 82 attended Sunday school and 135 attended worship. The congregation was formally organized on September 29th, 1946 with 62 charter members with a mission that it become the center of life for the community. The church became a model neighborhood church then followed six years of growth with significant events, such as dedication of an organ, opening of a new church building in December 1950, nursery kindergarten, full scout and church programs. It played a large role in the development of the base side neighborhood and in establishing Midway Manor Park and Midway Manor School. Above all, 
there was the transformation of people by the Lord Jesus Christ. While Catherine led in the music, Sunday school and women's fellowship during these years, there was growth in our family. Timothy arrived on October 15, 1946. Nanette arrived on November 25, 1947. And Martha arrived on April 23, 1951. After serving the Moravian Church faithfully and well in Pennsylvania, the Wideners headed west to California. Immediately following the sixth anniversary of the congregation with 203 communicants and 127 children, total membership 330, we left to establish churches in Southern California. Quoting correspondence from the PEC, Mervyn wrote in his memoir, perhaps the boldest step our church has taken in our generation. Mervyn accepted the call on September 16, 1952. Mervyn writes, Catherine and I left our furnishings in Allentown and with four young children drove across the country with no specific destination except Los Angeles County. No home to go to, no base of operation, and no congregation, no specific city. The Lord gave us faith to go out with good courage, not knowing where to go, but only that his hand was leading us and his love supporting us. Arriving in Los Angeles on November 1st, I drove 1,200 miles to explore areas for a church location, settling on Downey, finding a house to rent in Whittier for a few months, and entered our children in school, selected and negotiated for a church site in Downey, rented a wedding chapel as a temporary place for worship. Meanwhile, I visited Moravians scattered in the vast area. The first site was chosen, but it was rejected by the county and neighbors. The second site chosen was actually superior in an area of hundreds of new homes in the midst of the development. I had a house built for the parsonage. After serving the Moravian Church faithfully and well in California, the Wideners headed south to Florida. And the story continues. You may have gotten a glimpse of Mervyn's passion for church planting and church growth, for his practice of door-to-door -door visitation as his primary method, and for the zeal that he brought with him to serve the Moravian church and to serve humanity. I share with you an early picture of the family with all five children represented. If anyone is asking, that's Jane in Catherine's arms. And this is a picture from Southern California, uh, from the, the area of Downey Moravian Church. Mervyn Widener, was instrumental in starting a church in Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Coral Ridge Moravian Church, and in finding a location for the start of the church in Boca Raton. And just as he was ready to start a third church, he was called to Winston-Salem to serve the congregation that Catherine grew up in. Uh, Mervyn writes that Calvary Moravian Church in Winston-Salem had not only an impressive large sanctuary, but a spacious facility for Christian education. And he wrote a lot about the difference this made in the approach he took to his ministry. Because they were a downtown church, he suggested to the congregation that they start a preschool, which they did. He was there about eight months when he was called to 
serve in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania as senior pastor of Central Moravian Church. He was very surprised by the call, very disappointed by the call, tried to negotiate out of it. But fortunately for the Central Congregation, he accepted the call and moved to, to Bethlehem to serve as senior pastor of the congregation and as pastor of the, of the Moravian churches, the collection of Moravian churches in Bethlehem. Uh, there were several announcements in the newspaper about his arrival, uh, both describing the fact that Central had selected him as their new pastor and also displaying a delightful um, cover story on the family as they gathered in their new parsonage. Um, all five children and mom and dad uh, together at the, the parsonage on Church Street for, for Central Moravian Church. Uh, very often in reading brief histories of various Moravian congregations, I find that time is marked by the arrival and departure of particular ministers. It occurred to me in reading Mervyn Widener's Lebensloft that time is marked by relocation to new church work. Time is marked by the starting of new congregations. In Mervyn's words, I personally believed that through the leading of the spirit, I was guided into evangelism and new church development as primary interest throughout my ministry. I was motivated by a, a passion for the lost. When asked to describe my epiphany, I wrote, I have the ability to start new churches, to win people for Christ and his church one on one, to adapt all kinds of church settings excluding rural, to lead, to motivate others to create. I have been blessed with gifts of energy, enthusiasm, motivation, intensity. I feel the strongest when I'm challenged to do something uncharted, something new and different, something requiring total commitment. We offer thanks to God for Mervyn's faithful ministry and service and we celebrate with his family all the achievements he has had throughout the Moravian church from coast to coast here in the United States. It is my joy to hand over to Derek to invite Derek to present on Mary Matz. I'm going to start at the end, and I'm going to go back to uh, 17th of August in the year 2013 on a warm late summer day when I was over at East Hills and was preparing to welcome persons to come for the Reverend Dr. Mary Matz's celebration of life. At the time, we didn't have an air-conditioned sanctuary. We knew that there would be loads of people coming to the sanctuary. So we turned down the thermostat in all the surrounding rooms and blew as much cold air into the sanctuary as possible until uh, the time for the service. <clears throat> and sure enough, uh, as the service time approached, people began to come in, not only her former uh, colleagues, but also uh, those that Mary had served with, both in the community and within the broader Moravian church. At the time, I uh, saw Mary not only as an inspiration personally, but also as one who had prepared the way for my ministry at Mountain View. And as a um, previous pastor at East Hills, where I was serving at the time, for she served an interim uh, there at East Hills, an intentional interim. Intentional interimship was a good portion of what Mary Matz did, but only uh, a small portion, as you'll see when I get to uh, her, her Lebenslauf. But at any rate, um, it, was, it was my privilege to uh, commemorate Mary's life. Uh, there were people there from uh, the presses as well. Uh, she was um, obviously the first Moravian 
female pastor ordained in the 20th century after a break of some multiple centuries in which the Moravian church had not ordained women. Um, so that was the end, but I want to go back to the beginning and then sort of back loop and trace to uh, that day. The Reverend Dr. Mary Jane Matz uh, was originally born Mary Jane Bill uh, Dill to Olive and Charles Dill of Havertown, Pennsylvania on August 10th, 1931. Hopeton asked me to share Mary's Lebenslauf and uh, got me reflecting on the term Lebenslauf, which uh, can be translated as curriculum vitae or resume. In other words, a brief summary of what the individual has achieved over the course of a lifetime. But in Moravian usage, it's more of a reflection on their spiritual journey and the meaning of the spiritual journey, the meaning of a life well lived, life lived in the service of the Lord. And that is applicable, deeply applicable to Mary. But even more so, uh, Lebenslauf literally translates life's run or life's path. And this appeals to me when thinking about Mary because she not only followed a path uh, which was charted by her inner values, her inner interests, uh, her lifelong uh, personal interest in the life of the mind, in Christian religious education, uh, and in the faith and leadership development of laity. But that path also opened up new pathways for those who would follow her, for women who would follow her into the ordained ministry of the Moravian Church, Northern and Southern province in the 20th and 21st century. So I see Mary's path as, as opening the way for others. That path began, as I, began, as I said, in Havertown, Pennsylvania, uh, August 10th, 1931. Mary attended Grove City College in Western Pennsylvania, a little bit north of Pittsburgh, where she received her Bachelor of Arts degree. And while I was preparing her original memoir back in 2013, I got to read a marvelous biography of her in uh, her Alumni Association uh, magazine. Mary was a lifelong booster of uh, City Grove College and uh, tried unsuccessfully to get her son, uh, William Matz Jr. to attend there. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, though failing in that, uh, she continued to boost the college uh, throughout her entire life. And they were very proud to count her among um, their distinguished alumni. Uh, so uh, you can probably read something about Mary um, at uh, Grove City College, uh, or if you contact their alumni association, if you're interested. Upon her graduation in 1953, uh, she traveled to Athens, Ohio, where she became the director of Christian education at the First Presbyterian Church. Remember, this is one of her interests that is going to uh, persist throughout her lifetime, the interests of opening the way and providing knowledge to others. And while serving in that capacity, uh, she met who would become her future husband, uh, the late Reverend Matt, William Matz, uh, William Matt Sr. And she also, through him, became acquainted with the Moravian Church. The two were married on January 8, 1955. And Mary was very supportive of uh, William in his career, in his pastoral career. She was um, straddling the gap in roles between being a supportive pastoral spouse, but also of honoring her own pathway, her own sense of calling, her own sense of ministry. Um, and I am impressed by how she was able to juggle all those responsibilities in her life um, as Christian educator, as pastor, um, in her later service to the community and to the national church uh, and through the National Council of Churches, which we will get to. Um, but that balance is one thing that I would like to lift up in honoring Mary's memory. Uh, Mary and William went to uh, start a church at Hilltop Community Moravian Church. It's in uh, New, or was in New Hartford, uh, which is near Utica, New York. And in the next 16 years, Mary and William would start a family with the arrivals of sons William Jr. and Randall, Randy, and serve four Moravian congregations in Palmyra, 
uh, New Jersey, in Sharon, Ohio, in Lidditz, Pennsylvania, and in Edgeboro here in Bethlehem um, before uh, the Reverend William Matz was called to serve as the Dean of Moravian Theological Seminary and the Vice President of Moravian College. Mary made the most of this opportunity that she had and continued to follow that path that she had long traveled, continuing her education. She attended seminary and she graduated with a Master of Divinity degree. The Master of Divinity degree um, has long been required or been desired for ordination into uh, the ministry in the Moravian Church. Three months prior to her graduation, however, Mary was ordained by the Right Reverend Edwin Quartz, Bishop Quartz, on February 16th. 1975, becoming the first woman to assume this position uh, within the Moravian Church, Northern Province, since her 18th century uh, predecessors. I want to share with you a news clipping that I found from a Gettysburg newspaper, and I'll read it to you. Moravians ordain woman minister. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, AP, the wife of Dean of Theological Seminary, is the first Moravian minister in the Moravian Church of America. Mary Jane Matz, a native of Havertown, Pennsylvania, was ordained Sunday by Bishop Edwin Quartz. Her husband is the Reverend William Matz, Dean of the Moravian Theological Seminary, located on the campus of Moravian College here. Mrs. Matz, a 1953 graduate of Grove City College, says the ordination of a woman caused no problem in her church, as did a similar ceremony involving 11 women in the Episcopal Church in July. And that was the, the official line. Mary, in speaking with um, Bill Matz, William Matz Jr., um, was a pioneer and a trailbreaker. But if you read an article which um, Bishop Quartz wrote um, upon the occasion of her ordination, the, the title of the article was Ordaining a Servant of Jesus Christ. And the emphasis was always on service in the name of Jesus Christ. Mary desired to take her place, to share her gifts alongside of her male colleagues. But it was never, I don't believe, her intent um, to cause waves or to cause controversy. Nonetheless, controversy did find her. Um, and sometimes disparaging mail or messages or even hate mail would arrive at the family home and Mary faced resistance as an ordained female uh, clergy member in an era in which uh, there were not many women in the ministry. Discipleship is not without its cost. And I reflect that Mary in following this path that was set uh, early in her life, this love of the life of the mind, this love of learning, this love of sharing what she had learned with others, uh, in simply being herself and being true to herself and being true to her Savior, she bore a cross. This was her cross to bear, being faithful to um, her authentic calling, her sense of calling, and her sense of faithfulness to her Savior, her wanting to share with others. Mary was called and served for three years as an assistant pastor of Central Moravian Church, and she was appointed the director of educational ministries uh, in the Moravian Church Northern Province in 1979. She continued to educate herself, even as she was educating her others, receiving her Doctor of Ministry from Drew University uh, School of Religion in 1982. She's an author as well as an educator. She published many works, um, but I'd like to lift up to the 1983 Ministry Together, which focused on developing a closer working relationship between clergy persons and lay persons. Um, and this interest was reflected in Mary's role uh, in founding the Lehigh Valley Lay Academy uh, and in her lifetime work um, promoting uh, the education of laity and in their partnership with clergy in the church. When we're ordained, uh, one of the tasks that we are ordained to is equip the laity for the life of the ministry of the church. And Mary served for me uh, personally as, as a role model as well she did for many others in that regard. She also was aware of changing times, herself being part of those changing times and changing ways. And she wrote a book that appeared in 1990 called Choices, Choices, Choices. Um, it was a biblical uh, study on choices and values in a radically changing world. An ethic of service is evident throughout Mary's life. 
She nationally served our denomination as the vice president of the National Council of Churches. And she was uh, in that role, um, helping with the department which produced the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, which for many of us is the Pew Bible that we follow each Sunday um, in the churches. Not that she was on the translation uh, team, but that she was with the, uh, the church in the department which over, oversaw that. Um, in addition to the aforementioned Lay Academy that she served with, she also served on various boards and committees um, in the Lehigh Valley, the United Way, the YMCA, Rotary International, New Bethany Ministries, and the list goes on. Mary was interested in the development of laity of all ages, uh, especially in encouraging youth. And so she would go to Hope Conference and Renewal Center and help lead programs there as well as elsewhere. She led programs in Maryland, um, New Jersey, um, New York and Ohio um, for, for children. And um, specifically, I'd like to lift up her role as uh, a co-director of Grand Camp, dealing with grandparents and grandchildren, uh, which was held up at Hope uh, Conference and Renewal Center. It was this formidable list of achievements uh, that led to Mary being nominated and receiving from Moravian Theological Seminary, the John Huss Award on March 17th, 1995. That award took place uh, in the Seminary Alumni Association luncheon on that afternoon. And as Providence would have it, that was my senior year at the seminary and I was able to be there and to listen uh, as Mary was presented with that award and then listen as she shared her experience with those of us who were just beginning our ministries. And for me, um, as a male Moravian pastor, um, I look to Mary as one who is a trailblazer as a servant of Jesus Christ, certainly yes, uh, for what she did opening the way up for other women in the Moravian denomination, but also just for her incredible collegiality and her willingness to uh, build up others, um, regardless of background, regardless of how long or how short a period of time that she had known them. Um, and that was, that was also evident in the work uh, that she would do preparing the way for me when I followed her at Mountain View Moravian Church. Uh, my predecessor, full-time predecessor at Mountain View Moravian Church, um, had started there actually the year that I was, was born. Marlon Shostal started there the year that I was born. And so when you're following a, a person with that long a tenure at a congregation, it can be rather daunting. And Mary provided the continuity as well as the opening for transition and change and uh, do both to the collegiality of Marlon uh, in retiring and departing that congregation and the good work that Mary did in preparing the way. I found that to be an absolute blessing and I was very grateful uh, for the work that she did. And I had all these things in mind when on that warm Saturday, I welcomed the congregation over into the sanctuary at East Hills to say, servant of God, well done, enter into the joy of your master. And that is the life of the uh, Reverend Dr. Mary Matz, who passed into the more immediate presence of her savior um, on the 31st of July in the year 2013. Houghton? Thank you, Derek. With great joy, we invite Carol to lead us. It was Pastor Hopeton Clennon who presented the memoir of Doug Caldwell on July 26, 2014 in the sanctuary of Central Moravian Church. This is how he begins. A gifted communicator, a master storyteller, every friend's best friend, someone who made you feel you were the most important person in the world to him, and you are. He had a great heart and a beautiful soul. He loved God and he loved people. Doug's memoir and the other uh, memoir shared this evening, Mary Matz, are obviously not the I documents, uh, the autobiographical memoirs of many of the early Moravians, 
Mervyn's was somewhat of an eye document. But after having known Doug Caldwell for over 30 years, I can definitely see his fingerprints all over this document. The anecdotes that Doug himself told to his children, Ashley and Doug Jr. and other family members, who then told them to Hopeton, who incorporated them into the memoir. In the very first session of the Lenten series this year, Dr. Catherine Fall presented some thoughts about the value and character of memoirs in general and the clues they revealed about the world around them. Her thesis was that sometimes a memoir reflected the age in which a person lived and sometimes it provided a narrative that ran almost counter to the times. A memoir is very personal, very individual, she said, but it also helps provide the fabric that is wo woven into history itself. So keeping those observations in mind, as I review Doug's memoir this evening, I'll ask that you try to connect and compare what was happening in Doug's life with his particular time in history. In other words, do what Doug reminded me always to do. Look at the big picture. So think of Doug as a young man born in the South in Charlotte, North Carolina in May of 1943, before the end of World War II. Born into a family that included a sister, Mary Lynn, and twin brother, David. Doug's father, Frank, had a deep influence on Doug's life, teaching his children the value of education and a strong work ethic. He was intelligent and well-spoken with a dry sense of humor. His illness when Doug was very young and later his death when Doug was in college certainly had an effect on the family. In many ways, it made them all the more devout in their prayer lives and even more reliant on their Christian faith. Doug often spoke of his mother, Margaret, as an extraordinary woman. In many ways, a woman ahead of her time, a feminist, someone who advocated for kindergarten education in public schools. And Margaret was a college graduate at a time when that was unusual for a woman. Doug and David were very active children, always looking for adventure, I'm told, always trying to make money through their childhood enterprises, some of which did not work out that well, a paper route that was not their best effort, but they did get a reasonable return on the door-to-door -door cufflink and tie bar sales. At very least, they were able to hone their skills as salesmen as they canvassed their neighborhood. Doug played team sports, including football. He was active in student government and took part in the YMCA service club. As a teen, he attended Billy Graham crusades when he could. Hopton sums up Doug's early days so beautifully. He writes, they were raised in a time when family, church, and community provided a durable framework for life. And the boys' free-spirited natures were given flight from the strong foundation of their parents' expectations. After a memorable and as it turns out, life-threatening mission trip to Antigua, Doug attended Moravian College and later Moravian Theological Seminary, where he began to focus a bit on the ministry of spiritual healing, a focus which served him well in later years. It was in Bethlehem that he met and married Barbara Breutigam, a young woman from Nicaragua, at a ceremony in the old chapel on June 4th, 1966. Doug was ordained in his home church, Little Church on the Lane in Charlotte, but didn't remain in the South. In fact, he served his entire ministry in Pennsylvania at the Reading Moravian Church, then College Hill Moravian Church in Bethlehem, and finally Central Moravian Church from 1983 through 2009. What was the world like when Doug arrived at Central Church in 1983, following the long pastorate of Dr. Mervyn Widener? Ronald Reagan was president at the time. Paul Marstensen was mayor of Bethlehem and the man for whom Barbara worked for years. Donald Troutline was CEO of the Bethlehem Steel, an almost all encompassing institution in the community that was just beginning to feel the financial stresses that would eventually lead to its closing. No doubt Central Church was influenced by and benefited by Bethlehem Steel employees and executives who were church members, 
and who served in leadership roles on church boards. And Central's boards clearly wanted their new pastor to be a leader in the community, take part in the social life, have special gifts for administration, and focus on the financial well being of the church. Doug more than fulfilled those early expectations. Hopeton notes in the memoir that when Doug retired as senior pastor at Central Moravian Church on November 1st, 2009, among his many areas of service for the Moravian Church at large are the eight years he served as a member of the Eastern District Executive Board, over 25 years as a Board of Trustee member at St. Luke's University Health Network, where he also served as chair. He was a trustee of Moravian College, trustee of Moravian Academy. He has served on the board of AAA East Penn and most recently as a trustee on the board of AAA East Central. He was a founding force behind Moravian Village and the expansion of Moravian Houses. He initiated the Congregational Partnership in Sakange, Tanzania, East Africa. I think here it's really important to emphasize Doug's pivotal influence on radically transforming the old Moravian Congregation of Bethlehem, which was an early organizational structure that included three churches, Central, College Hill, and Westside, into a more expansive organization called Bethlehem Area Moravians, which included six local Moravian churches. Most notably, BAM, as it was called, would go on to sponsor the development of Moravian Village, a continuing care retirement community that Doug worked hard to promote. It was Doug's shocking resignation as head pastor of the old congregation that symbolically helped to precipitate a new vision of what could take the place of an outmoded and financially strained organization founded far back in time. The creation of this new entity, Bethlehem Mary Moravians in 1992, coincided with the 250th anniversary of Moravians in Bethlehem it was a big event in the life of the community and one that Doug personally helped to shape. Doug loved big events and grand displays. He celebrated the 250th anniversary with a massive outdoor love feast and helped to fund it through developing products for sale, like the Moravian coverlets that he proudly promoted. He gleefully took part in the Raise the Roof program, popping out from a window of the massive church built inside the church sanctuary at the Children's Love Feast. He coordinated a major conference called Women's Voices, Women's Choices in partnership with Moravian College and with St. Luke's Hospital. It was a conference featuring speaker Anita Hill. He put his energy and ideas behind several large capital campaigns including one for the renovation of many of the buildings on campus and another for major renovations of the sanctuary organ. He partnered with ArtsQuest and opened Central to Music Fest concerts and over-the-top Christmas presentations in which he dressed as Count Zinzendorf, portraying him with a slight Southern accent. On your screen, on the photo at the left, you'll see Doug and Barbara in 1999 in front of the old chapel at the time of the recreation of the Great Wedding of 1749. Doug invited couples who had been married there to come back and renew their vows together. The one at the top of the screen is of Doug and others in front of the chapel at the 200th anniversary of the building of Central Church. We processed from the chapel to the church after that photo was taken to celebrate the conclusion of that building project. And the bottom photo is one that Doug especially loved was a photo on canvas of the church belfry displayed in the sanctuary apse. So many memorable events were sparked by Doug and fueled by his reaching connections in the community. When anyone ever questioned how those events were going to be funded, he repeated one of his favorite sayings, money is never the problem. But as much as he reveled in the grand events, Doug also devoted himself to making intimate friends, to offering himself to those who were sick, to grieving families, to people whose personal pain never scared him away. People often said that they were grateful for his sincere prayers when he visited, prayers that sustained them and gave them hope. 
gregarious and extroverted in the extreme, he found humor in so many ordinary situations and even the really difficult situations. And he looked for intrigue in the subplots in life as he called them. I think we can safely say that Doug not only fit into his time and setting, he relished the journey. And borrowing from Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, the scripture that Doug used as a basis for his final sermon in 2014, despite any personal trials and challenges he faced, all in all, he would say that God meant it for good. His family, friends, and colleagues would well agree his was a life well lived. I hope that you take some time to view a fascinating videotaped interview of Doug from September of 2012 and one of Barbara as well. You can find them online on his brother-in-law Dan's family website at danmoral.org. Thank you so much, Carol. Now we come to the time when we get a chance to ask any of our presenters questions that we might have. And if it would be helpful if you would indicate you have an interest in asking a question by putting an asterisk in the chat. Diane, we have a question from Diane Shaw. Thank you, Hopeton. Can you, you can hear me, can't you? Can Very you, well. Okay, good, good. Thank you all. That was just really meaningful and, and fascinating. I have a question and probably maybe would we'll direct it to Carol. Um, I know that, you know, the, the tradition of people writing their own Lebensloff really sort of decreased. I mean, Mervyn left one, but but with Doug and Mary, the pastors were responsible for compiling it. H how would you assess how long that has been the norm for Moravian churches? I don't know of comparative stories that I could tell you other than the fact that when I interviewed um, the widow of Dr. Walser Allen who preceded Mervyn in ministry, he not only wrote his own Lebenslauf, he wrote the Lebenslauf for his wife as well. And she was still living at the time. <laughs> so uh, perhaps it was more prevalent in earlier times that uh, people wrote their own uh, memoirs. I tend to think that sometimes pastors believe that their sermons reflect a kind of Lebenslauf as well. But it's an interesting question. It would be good to research that. Thank you. Are there any other questions we might have for any of our presenters? If not, I'll... we have a question from Shelia. Um, hello, good night, everyone. I was just curious to know um, why you chose these three people. What is there a thread that goes through to bind them together? Or was it just a, wouldn't say random, but why these three? I would be happy to answer, but the questioner and I live in the same house. So Diane, <laughs> Diane this is all yours. Okay. Um, well, when Hopeton and I were talking about how we might make this, um, you know, we had the historical Lebensloff that for the first two sessions and how we might bring it into the present and who we might focus on to, to tell that a little bit of that story and how, how the Lebensloff evolved. Um, uh, and so it was pretty easy, really. We, you know, um, looked at, at Central first and, and, and noted that 
two very long serving pastors. And then Hopeton said, we must, we need a woman. We need to have a woman represented. And of course, Mary Matz was Hopeton's immediate suggestion. So I had not had the pleasure or the, of knowing her. So it, it was, I was really thrilled by having her as, um, as one of the three. Thank you. All well done. I knew Mary, I knew Doug, and I got to know Marvin. So thank you. <laughs> Our next question is from Hank and Karen. Hank or Karen? I'm sorry, thank you. Certainly. <laughs> um, our three presenters are pastors and I'm curious whether they enjoy writing memoirs by asking family members or whether they would like to receive a Lebensloff. I will be quick on the draw. <laughs> I desperately plead to receive a Lebensloff. <laughs> Please take the time, send me your first page while you work on the remaining 11 pages. <laughs> but I, I just need that start. We have green hanging folders ready to receive them. Um, Maggie will talk to us two weeks from today a little bit about preparing our own and I encourage you to do so. Derek or Carol, any comments? I do appreciate having some notes or some kind of, uh, maybe not a formal Lebenslauf, but certainly notes are helpful. I, I enjoy meeting with family and, and friends uh, very often. It's, it's, uh, it feels a little rushed and we want to get as much representation as possible from people. So maybe both, maybe both. I was gonna say both. Um, I, I, I find that there's a blessing, uh, not only in seeing the person through their own eyes, but also seeing them through the eyes of those who love them, those, those um, who were with them throughout, throughout that journey of life. And so I think both um, are, are wonderful. The Lebensdorf is a wonderful place to start. I highly recommend people doing it. Uh, at one point, uh, they picked up all Moravian clergy were having to write a Lebenslauf uh, in seminary before they graduated. Um, the late um, Reverend Dr. Glenn Asquith uh, had that as part of his um, pastoral counseling coursework at the seminary. And so in my era, everybody was writing uh, Lebenslaufs about how their journey had gone up to the point of entering seminary. Now, whether they continued that after they left the seminary, um, I guess was up to each one of them. Thank you, Derek. Our next question comes to us from Barry Pell. Barry is adjusting to unmute and he is getting ready for us. There we go. There I am. My question has nothing to do with Lebenslau, but I couldn't help but notice that the picture of Downey Moravian Church has a belfry that is almost identical to Central's. And yet this was Pastor Widener was there long before he came to Central. So maybe he was sending a secret message that that's really where he wanted to end up. Just a comment, <laughs> not a question. He contracted with an architect in Los Angeles to design a roof line and belfry to reflect Central Church and to give birth to the book, The Belfry That Moved, and to inspire Fred Bees to do a piece of artwork uh, with a mirror image of both belfries in the same frame. Thanks for making that observation, Barry. And Hank and Karen, you may have another question, and that might be our last question for the evening. 
I'm sorry. I just wanted to give a plug for Bernie Michael's book, The Belfry That Moved. <laughs> Abs absolutely wonderful. Thank you for doing that. Uh, We are grateful to all our presenters for their work today, for the uh, focus that they brought to each of the individuals' lives well lived. We have come to the end of our time together. This series has two sessions remaining. Join us at 7 p.m. next Wednesday, March 17th, when our keynote speaker will be the Reverend Jill Vogt making the live presentation from her home in Hernhut, Germany. Her focus will be the Moravian Lebenslauf as a tool for spiritual reflection and Christian witness. The Zoom login information is the same for the entire series. We look forward to seeing you here next Wednesday evening. Carol? As we reflected on the life stories of three dedicated pastors this evening, and as we seek encouragement for our own life's journey, may the grace of God deeper than our imagination, the strength of Christ stronger than our need, the communion of the Holy Spirit richer than our togetherness, guide and sustain us today and in all our tomorrows. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.